احنا دلوقتي لايف اتفضل يا دكتوره طيب ويلكم ايفريبادي بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ذيس از مي دكتور حنان الغامدي Uh, for those who doesn't know me, I'm a hepatobiliary uh, multi-organ transplant and uh, laparoscopic surgeon, uh, vice president of uh, ETHAR Society, uh, who's organizing this uh, 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 meeting, sponsoring this meeting, uh, and organized by uh, event troops. Uh, today, we have this special uh, scientific seminar uh, comes with the uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, epidemic of uh, uh, pandemic of uh, coronavirus is hitting the world, and the uh, coronavirus is uh, taking uh, a grip in the world. Uh, as we speak, uh, the total number of cases coronaviruses worldwide is quarter to a million, uh, and death is climbing up to 35, more than 35,000. Uh, similarly, uh, we have we still having uh, 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 climbing cases here in Saudi Arabia. Uh, we gathered uh, a panel of uh, experts from the region. Uh, we are grateful that they gave us from their time. Uh, hopefully, that uh, we convey a good message at the end of uh, uh, the scientific uh, program. Uh, Better outcome better, uh, comes from a better understanding and preparation for uh, the corona uh, cases. Uh, we know that some teams in the region are distinguished in their results. Uh, this is come, uh, uh, must be after a good and hard uh, uh, homework and teamwork and good preparation. Uh, here with me is the three distinguished uh, speakers from the region. We, uh, without further ado, I will uh, start introducing the speaker. Uh, sorry for the delay. Uh, we have a bit of technical uh, issue, but I assure you it is not a coronavirus uh, affecting our uh, program. Uh, we will just a few housekeeping uh, uh, notes. Uh, we will uh, uh, defer all questions to the end of uh, all three talks. Uh, and we will pick questions from the hashtag that we posted, uh, Najat Marid, on patient survival. Uh, so we will take these uh, questions from the uh, Twitter. Uh, and uh, we cannot answer all the questions, but uh, those related to our presentation will be uh, answered by uh, uh, our nice uh, uh, speakers. Here with me, uh, our first speaker, Dr. Uh, Hatem uh, Alhani, very, very busy uh, uh, person uh, nowadays because he's a consultant in pediatrics and pediatric infection disease, Eastern Region Health Affairs, the MAM, Saudi Arabia. We gladly uh, could have uh, uh, some time allocated to us. And his talk will be about novel uh, coronavirus. Uh, COVID-19 overview. Uh, please, Dr. Hatem, if you are ready, uh, the screen and the mic is yours. No, next speaker, Dr. Okay. I think Dr. Hatem is, is not ready. Okay. Then, uh, uh, We'll, we'll, go, we'll go on with our uh, program. Uh, Dr. Abdel Razik Amir, uh, nephrologist, Chief of uh, Office of Academic uh, Affairs, John Hopkins uh, Dahran, Saudi Arabia. And uh, his topic is surviving uh, COVID-19 pandemics, recommendation for the nephrologist. Please, uh, Dr. Uh, Amir, you have uh, 20 minutes. And the video is used. Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, it's my pleasure and uh, honor uh, to contribute to this uh, scientific uh, forum uh, for, for tonight. The topic I'm going to talk about today is uh, uh, surviving COVID-19 uh, pandemic 
Um, and this, the message is uh, uh, a special message to uh, our colleague nephrologists in the region, uh, in the kingdom and worldwide. Um, the outline of my presentation, I'm going to talk about briefly about the story of the 2019 novel coronavirus, talking a little bit about the disease risk and clinical presentation, and uh, uh, with more emphasis on the kidney involvement and impairment associated with this virus. And then we're going to review quickly um, some uh, available uh, up-to-date uh, guideline mitigating the risk of COVID-19 uh, in this vulnerable uh, patient group, uh, the chronic kidney disease and in this stage renal disease patient. And finally, in the last three or four minutes, uh, I, I hope the time will allow, um, I will uh, try to uh, discuss the controversy uh, uh, regarding the uh, use of angiotensin uh, receptor blockers or angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors uh, in patients with COVID-19. So uh, without further ado, uh, uh, let me talk about the, uh, this, uh, the history of the virus. Uh, in December 2019, uh, a series of unknown uh, cases of acute respiratory illness uh, appeared in Wuhan, you know, uh, Wuhan uh, Hubei uh, um, province in China, and that was related to the novel uh, coronavirus. This novel coronavirus is found to be a, a new zoonotic human coronavirus uh, related to, to bat uh, or bat in origin. The genome sequence of this virus uh, ha has a lot of resemblance to the bat SARS-like coronavirus, the beta coronavirus genus. And uh, in uh, January, early January 2020, the Chinese CDC recognized and announced the SARS-CoV-2 as an outbreak uh, in the country. Uh, later, on, um, um, uh, later on in January, the WHO declared a global public health emergency regarding, regarding the outbreak of the SARS-CoV-2. Um, and then a uh, few um, weeks later, the WHO officially named the disease as um, This uh, 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 virus turned to be a very contagious and human-to-human -human, uh, transmission uh, has been uh, confirmed by the WHO and the CDC in the United States. And uh, uh, the evidence for person-to-person -person transmission uh, from, uh, uh, was documented in, in, in three respective cases uh, from US, Germany, and uh, Vietnam. And, and therefore, uh, uh, around uh, two weeks ago, or about 20 days ago or so, uh, the WHO declared uh, the outbreak of COVID-19 uh, as a pandemic worldwide. So it's a very contagious uh, uh, virus uh, spread by droplet and direct contact. However, it's also shed in the feces and the most uh, shedding uh, fluid or liquid uh, that can be uh, where the virus is, uh, can be found is the bronchoalveolar lavage and sputum. It has a short incubation period of three to seven days and can infect, infect all ages group uh, at large, including children. Most of the patient present with a very symptoms uh, uh, and uh, very few or maybe around 15 to 20 percent of the patient may present with more severe form or critically illness uh, that uh, resemble ARDS like. Fever and cough are the most prodromal symptoms of this uh, infection uh, as most uh, almost 100 percent of the patient will have some some type of fever. Uh, cough is in happen in 75 percent of the patient and then other constitutional symptoms of myalgia, arthalgia, and fatigability are also uh, reported. It carries uh, less mortalities than its cousin, the SARS-CoV uh, and the MERS-CoV uh, infection. The uh, estimated mortality is about 1.5 to 4%. And um, it is very important to know that uh, having a comorbid medical condition um, uh, will, on, will not only increase the risk uh, of having the infection, but also it will increase the risk of complications uh, and delay recovery. And these risk factors in general uh, are the older uh, and hypertension, diabetes, and having some uh, organ dysfunction, uh, like heart failure, liver failure, and other things. Uh, this is best uh, represented uh, uh, in, in this uh, uh, study by Wang, which was published in Gamma, uh, which, uh, looking, at, uh, looking at 138 hospitalized patients with COVID-19 pneumonia uh, in Wuhan, China. 
And you can see that uh, the, the median age was 56 uh, in total. Um, and um, this study in particular highlighted the presumed human to human uh, hospital uh, associated transmission. Uh, and uh, which happens actually in almost 41% of the patient, including medical staff, 40%, 40, 40 medical staff were involved uh, in this uh, human to human as, uh, hospital associated transmission. And if you look at the, uh, uh, the uh, pattern of the patient with, uh, who were admitted to the ICU, they were older than the, non the patient who were not admitted to the ICU. And those patients admitted to the ICUs, they carried uh, more uh, comorbidities. They have comorbidities more than those who actually uh, were not um, involved. So how, how uh, the kidney is involved in COVID-19? Uh, well, uh, it can be simple proteinuria or even macroscopic hematuria to even severer form of involvement uh, uh, as acute kidney injury, uh, which may require uh, dialysis uh, and so forth. So uh, the proteinuria and hematuria uh, uh, is a well-known uh, um, uh, presentation uh, of kidney injury uh, in this group of patients. Uh, Sheng, uh, in his publication in the Kidney International, uh, 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 in a single center uh, series of 701 patients, uh, reported that 44% of, the, of their patients had proteinuria and hematuria, while almost 27% of the patients, the patient, they had uh, uh, hematuria, uh, isolated hematuria. There was also elevation of serum creatinine and urea nitrogen in almost 15% of the patient. Those patients who developed acute kidney injury, they realized that it, acute kidney injury by itself was an independent risk factor for in-hospital mortality. Now, we should stop here for a minute because, well, whether the proteinuria and hematuria are feature of the acute kidney injury or they were actually present as the patient had uh, um, uh, underlying chronic kidney disease. Unfortunately, in this paper uh, by Sheng, it, uh, you could not uh, differentiate whether this was an acute or versus a chronic uh, finding because most of the patient did not have underlying uh, a baseline or a pre-hospital uh, serum creatinine value. Another series of 51 patients with COVID-19 uh, was published early this year, also uh, revealed that almost 34% of the patient, they had uh, significant albuminuria on admission. And this, the degree of proteinuria or albuminuria has significantly increased uh, later on uh, in the course of the hospital. Uh, uh, hospitalization. And this is maybe uh, important because this indicates that this group of patients were uh, sicker and they have, uh, they, they stayed in hospital for a long time. But we should remember also that fever by itself, febrile illness by itself can, can uh, cause uh, some degree of proteinuria. So um, in this, um, in this um, graph here, the data I'm showing here, uh, of AKI uh, in hospitalized patient was COVID-19 as uh, the uh, the uh, uh, AKI in acute kidney injury developed within seven days of the admission uh, in most of the cases. Uh, some of the reports uh, re uh, indicated that AKI happened actually in fifteen uh, in the mean in the median of fifteen days rather than seven days. However, uh, the uh, the, uh, the data here are a bit sketchy because uh, there, there is variability in the testing rates uh, and the denominator uh, was uncertain. Uh, however, so having said that, the uh, incidence of acute kidney injury is as low as 0.5% and it can go uh, as high as 23%. Um, uh, you should also look at the uh, right side of the uh, table where uh, there's, uh, the, you could see there's a lot of comorbidities associated with the development uh, of AKI on, on, on those group of patients. Uh, again, we're talking about hypertension, diabetes, uh, chronic kidney disease, and, and other things. Uh, the pathogenesis of acute kidney injury, uh, the mechanism is unclear. However, uh, um, remember those, those patients uh, with who develop acute kidney injury, they uh, they, they, they develop it uh, in the context of uh, uh, multi-organ failure uh, and overwhelming sepsis. So sepsis can lead to a cytokine storm uh, syndrome. And we know uh, from, the, uh, from, the, uh, uh, from the literature 
that, for example, the, uh, the interleukin-6, for example, is a major driver uh, for, to, uh, for cyto, uh, cytokine release. And this can lead, uh, this has led the investigator and the researcher to develop a, a specific uh, uh, IL-6 inhibitor, uh, the toclizumab, uh, which we are using uh, uh, on trial basis uh, for treatment of uh, COVID-19. Uh, rhabdomyolysis is, uh, is uh, very, in a, happen in a very small proportion of patient. Uh, uh, direct cell injury, uh, this, is, this is very interesting because, uh, uh, you know, direct cell injury means that you have an active viral uh, invasion of the cells uh, uh, and uh, replication inside the, uh, the uh, favorable tissues. Uh, uh, this uh, will take us uh, back to, uh, uh, to the ACE2, ACE2, which is angiotensin converting enzyme. Uh, this enzyme uh, receptor is actually prevalent uh, um, uh, in larger quantity in certain organs in the body, including uh, kidneys, uh, uh, heart, intestine, uh, of course, uh, the alveolar, uh, alveolar tissues uh, too. So uh, the, uh, these ACE2 work as a, a receptor for uh, the, uh, the, the S protein or the spine protein of the, uh, uh, the SARS-CoV-2. Um, and it, it, it anchored the virus to the surface of the, uh, of the, uh, of the cell. And then uh, 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 it, it, the, uh, for, the, uh, for the virus to uh, uh, download its content down into the cell, uh, it, has to be, it has to be primed uh, by a transmembrane uh, protease uh, serine 2 in, uh, enzyme. So these are very interesting uh, findings. Uh, uh, the, the last two uh, lines in my slide, it indicate that there has been a successful isolation of the SARS-CoV-2 uh, particles uh, uh, and PCR uh, from the urine sample of the infected patient. And as well as it happened uh, before with the SARS and the MERS-CoV, where the uh, uh, viral RNA was identified in the kidney tissue and the urine. So what is the renal pathology with, in COVID-19 cases? Um, the renal pathology uh, was studied in autopsies of six patients who died uh, from the disease. They found that most of the patients or all the patients have severe acute tubular necrosis, ATN, uh, at large. And the immune histochemistry uh, uh, demonstrated uh, uh, the, the nucleocapsid protein of the virus inside the kidney, which is, again, very interesting because it just indicates that there is a viral invasion into the kidney. So uh, why, why this is important? Why, this, why, why, we, why the API uh, is significant uh, uh, in patients with COVID-19? Uh, well, it is important because it, it uh, determines the overall uh, um, outcome of, uh, and, and, and prognosis. So in this uh, paper by Sheng, uh, he had um, uh, um, uh, a 701 patient enrolled in this uh, review. Uh, most of them, they have uh, severe diseases and there was uh, about 16% in hospital death. Uh, if you see uh, most of these patients, they have uh, a laboratory finding in the form of elevated serum, creatinine, BUN, uh, proteinuria, and hematuria. In addition, that 5.1% uh, of the patient develop acute kidney injury. So uh, uh, looking at the tox uh, proportional hazard uh, progression uh, here, you will find out that uh, proteinuria, hematuria, elevated urea nitrogen, creatinine, uh, all these, in general, uh, they, they were independent risk factor uh, for the in-hospital death uh, after adjusting for the age six uh, disease severity and uh, uh, comorbidities. Similar finding was found in this uh, publication, uh, this retrospective observational study of 193 cases. Again, AKI was uh, a patient who have AKI had 5.3 times mortality compared to those who did not have acute kidney injury. So, um, so, the, so what, uh, how we can mitigate the disease um, uh, and preventing it from spreading, especially among our uh, vulnerable uh, uh, patient, including the CKD and the SS population. Uh, there is, has been uh, several uh, guidelines available. Uh, the, some, of, some of them are very gen general, generic, and some of them are very specific to this type of population. In Saudi Arabia here, of course, we use the, uh, the National Center for Disease Prevention and Control, Rikaya, uh, um, uh, from Ministry of Health who posted, they posted a series of preventive guidelines uh, and they keep updating them uh, uh, almost uh, every couple of weeks basis. I have, I, I'm using the, uh, currently the March 22 version. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and again, this is very important. 
What I was uh, interested in, and I think uh, my colleague nephrologist should, should look into this, is this is the CDC COVID-19 outpatient dialysis facility preparedness assessment tool. This is a very, very nice tool. Uh, the website uh, or the link, you can, uh, you can find the, uh, the link here, down here, and you can download the, this tool, assessment tool, and you can apply it to your facility to, to, to determine the preparedness of, uh, of your facility for, this, uh, for the COVID-19. Again, uh, these are the elements. I'm just not going to go through them quickly because they, they have uh, because of the short of time. However, uh, let me move on to the uh, other important things. The, the CDC guidelines for dialysis center, uh, they uh, actually um, uh, published this. Uh, in addition to the common, well-known infectious control guidelines, they have, have a specific guideline for dialysis center. The screening of patient, starting from screening of patient, and then uh, how to handle the patient, how to move patient in the, in the units, how to uh, contaminate the infection. All these findings, you will find it in the CDC guideline for the Alice Center. Uh, let me just go through some of them quickly for the sake of um, uh, uh, the knowledge here. So patient with symptoms or to those who are traveled to uh, uh, an area, an epidemic area, or they have a contact with COVID-19, they should call ahead of the time to the dialysis unit. If they don't, shouldn't come to the dialysis unit, they should call ahead and, and, and let them know that they have the contact or they have some symptoms, so the facility will anticipate their arrival. There has to be a screening personnel at the entry of the facility, and this personnel have to ask the patient the three questions. Did you have any symptoms? Did you travel? Did you have contact with COVID-19 patient? So if the patient said yes, then you have to uh, give, give him a, a, a mask uh, a face mask and take him to an area away from the general waiting uh, room. Patients who are stable, they can actually wait in their car or outside the dialysis facility. Uh, patients who have fever and symptoms, they should be um, uh, treated as a patient uh, who is infected with COVID-19 and until their definite testing uh, arrive. Patient with progressive symptoms, they should be immediately uh, admitted to the hospital because of the risk of, uh, of developing ARDS. Patient replacement, uh, placement, uh, where, to, uh, where to isolate and where to put, uh, where to put them is uh, uh, valuable here. But uh, it, what intrigued me in this CDC guidelines is what I found here. The CDC guidelines does not require the patient infected with COVID-19 to be treated in airborne infection isolation room. This is very interesting because that's what we do in our hospital. But why we're doing it in our hospital and other uh, institutes because we want to contain the infection. Uh, if you have the space, you can do it. If you don't have the space, then you can just put it in a room, separate room with a door closed, okay? And, and we move on on this. And of course, decontamination and disinfection is must. Now, the European Society uh, of Renal Associate uh, and the, the European uh, Dialysis Transplant Associate put their recommendation. I'm not gonna go through them. Again, they are available on their website. But I'm just... Uh, uh, um, alerting uh, the group that we have these guidelines available. Recently, the American Society of Nephrology also issued their guidelines, and they, the guidelines uh, talk about patients with acute kidney injury or in the stage renal disease who are treated in the, in the ICU setup or they are treated in the floor setup. And the most important thing I highlighted here is that please, please, please remember your PPEs and, uh, uh, and recommend your read your, your safety guidelines. And uh, if you can, uh, if you, of course, you can minimize and avoid the daily patient contact and like nephrologists, instead of going to the ICUs and uh, wearing gowns and uh, popping in and out and just to, to, assist, to look at the urine and assist the thing, please ask your colleague uh, intensivist to relay uh, the, the, uh, the, their finding, the physical exam and other critical parameters to you. The ICU team, the nurses, they will help you in getting that. Indication to start renal replacement therapy is the same like with any other patient. And you can use either the continuous renal replacement therapy, or you can use uh, the uh, prolonged intermittent renal replacement therapy, the, the SLED and what have you. Uh, 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 you could use intermittent hemodialysis if you don't have CRRT available, and please follow your institution policies in that regard. Um, if you have limited resources, so I don't have a, a Prisma machine, enough Prisma machine to run all the dialysis stations. Uh, that I have in the ICU. Then what you do is uh, you could use one single machine to, to run two, two patients uh, simultaneous uh, back to back. So what you do, you use the CRT machine for prolonged intermittent treatment, 10 hours instead of 24 hours. 
and use a higher flow rate of 40 to 50 mm per kilo per, per hour. And this will help uh, the, uh, to, to maintain and uh, control the, uh, uh, the, uh, the fluid overload and uh, solute clearance. Okay, so the last few minutes, I'm gonna talk uh, briefly about the big debate, which is uh, the RAS blockade in COVID-19 patient, to take the medicine or not to take the medicine, to be or not to be. So, so, so let me let me uh, make you first understand what is the COVID, what is the uh, what is the uh, uh, angiotensin converting enzyme to uh, do. So everyone knows probably uh, the classic uh, renin, renin angiotensin system, which starts from the angiotensinogen converting to angiotensin one, angiotensin two by the ACE enzyme. And angiotensin two uh, exert its uh, effect on the AT1 receptor. Um, uh, by uh, causing vasoconstriction, it has a pro-atrophy and pro-fibrosis properties and pro-oxidant and stimulate the sympathetic activation. Overall, it causes more tissue injury. It's not good, it's not favorable. While the 82 receptors, on the other hand, the stimulation of the 82 receptor is really nice and benign. It causes vasodilatation, it has an anti-proliferation uh, properties, it has anti-inflammatory properties, uh, it reduces oxidation, so it really uh, uh, have a protective tissue effect. So this is the classic uh, 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 and angiotensin system uh, axis. There is another axis called the alternative axis where the angiotensin one, by, the, by, uh, by, the, by, by using an enzyme called angiotensin converting enzyme two, it converts angiotensin one to angiotensin one to nine and then angiotensin one to seven. Well, angiotensin one to seven, it binds to a receptor uh, the mitochondrial uh, assembly receptor, uh, which actually, uh, this axis, the ACE2, angiotensin 17, and the mass receptor, they actually produce a very favorable tissue protective effect, similar, in, similar to the 82 receptor. So it causes vasodilatation, it causes anti proliferation, anti inflammatory properties, and so forth. So, so this, this axis, the alternative axis, uh, run by the uh, ACE2. Uh, enzyme is a very, very uh, good, uh, favorable access uh, in contrary to the activation of the AT1 receptor. So, so moving from here, let me take you to the slide that uh, it took me a while to prepare, but uh, it, it, it carry a lot of messages here. So once again, the, this is the, uh, the lung cell uh, membrane. This is uh, the alveolar cells. Uh, angiotensin 1 uh, uh, convert by the ACE to angiotensin 2, and the angiotensin 2 stimulate the AT1 receptor on the surface of the lung cell membrane. And of course, as we said earlier, the angiotensin 1 can convert to by the ACE2 enzyme to angiotensin 1 to 7, which will uh, uh, exert its uh, effect on the uh, mitochondrial assembly receptor, as, as seen in this illustration here. How about if I block the ACE enzyme by ACE inhibitor, and I block the receptor, the AT1 receptor by ARPS. What's going to happen? Well, if I block the, ACE, uh, the AT1 receptor and the, if I block the ACE uh, enzyme, I don't produce much of angiotensin 2. So not, not, no more activation of the AT1 receptor happen, um, uh, uh, theoretically. And then we have also the ARPS. The ARPS block the AT1 receptor, and you will not have the negative uh, exertion. Uh, okay, so, so what's happening here is that in addition to this uh, blockage favorable effect, so less AT1 receptor nasty effect, it also upregulates the ACE2 uh, enzyme. So what it does, so more of the angiotensin 1 uh, is uh, changed angiotensin 1 to 7, which is good thing, uh, we, we, we like it it actually uh, reduce uh, uh, less, less atrophy, it's anti-atrophy, antioxidant, anti-proliferative, so it's a good effect here. And, and then also, it increase the availability of the ACE2 on the surface of the lung cell membrane. Why this is, is a problem? This part is a problem because the, the S protein of the coronavirus um, uh, adhere to the ACE2 and it anchors itself on the surface membrane. So this is not a good thing. So we have few things good done by, the, by, the, uh, by blocking the, uh, the cascade uh, of the angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2, but we have also uh, the increase of AZ, uh, ACE2, 
will, uh, will, will mean that there is more of these uh, ACE2 available for the virus to anchor into and then get an access to the cells and cause more damage and harm into the cells. However, this idea brought the researcher to a new uh, di discovery or proper, pro prob probably uh, a new uh, treatment for the coronavirus, which is the development of, uh, of a recombinant ACE2. A recombinant ACE2 will enhance more angiotensin 1-7 uh, production, and this will help uh, 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 to uh, um, um, uh, decrease the AT1 receptor effect. But in addition to that, it will adhere to the virus and will not allow its uh, um, uh, anchoring into the uh, cells. So uh, uh, briefly, uh, just to summarize the two slides I just presented, this is the angiotensin converting enzyme, the AS2. It has uh, a bad effect because it will allow uh, entry, uh, entry of the virus, the SARS-CoV and the SARS-CoV-2, uh, into the cells because it anchored to it, but it has also a good effect by increasing the production of angiotensin 1 to 7. So the question here is, what's happened if the ACE2 level is in the cells uh, is decreased? Uh, does it help to fight the infection? This is the question. Well, from the studies, from what, whatever information we have, there is an animal studies where the interaction, we showed the interaction of the spike protein of the coronavirus with ACE2 down-regulate the level of ACE2, so you don't have much of ACE2. So when you decrease the ACE2, you enhance lung injury and other organ injury. In contrary, the, uh, there's also animal studies where showed that the ACE inhibitor and the ARPS, they upregulate uh, the ACE2 expression, uh, and in a sense that it will help the production of one, one to seven, but in the same time, it, it may affect the severity of the uh, uh, coronavirus infection. This all animal studies. There's nothing done in human yet. So there is a systemic review and meta-analysis where the, where the use of ACE inhibitor was associated with significant uh, reduction in the risk of pneumonia, even in a higher risk uh, patient like the stroke patient or heart failure. So the European Society of Cardiology uh, in their uh, latest uh, news, they strongly recommended that his physician and patient should continue treatment with the usual antihypertensive therapy because there is no clinical or scientific evidence to suggest that treatment with ACE inhibitor or ARPS should be discontinued because of the COVID-19 infection. These are one only society, but guess what? There's 12 more. All these societies, the European Society of Hypertension, the European Society of Cardiology, Hypertension Canada, Canadian Cardiovascular Society, and many, many more, they all recommended continuation of the A's and the ARPS, and these are the date when the updated uh, information. So, so the take home message uh, from my presentation, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are facing a pandemic. This is true. And here, team building with a structured plan will save us. I think team building means you should know your operation as a nephrologist, as an intensivist, as a hospitalist, uh, as a healthcare worker, even the janitor in the hospital has something to do. Um, so please make sure that you know your operation, you know your plan, you review your infectious control uh, guidelines, you, uh, you, uh, you build up your team in the right way. And then understanding the pathogenesis of the COVID-19 uh, will, will, will help us to understand and manage uh, this uh, pandemic. Uh, knowing now more about the ACE2, knowing more about the, uh, the IL-6 um, uh, inhibitors, knowing more about the, these uh, new antiviral medications that have been uh, 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 published and used. And the, uh, as I said, uh, as I, I, I mentioned probably earlier, the WHO um, uh, on March 20th announced uh, the launch of the Solidarity Major Study uh, to put all the, uh, uh, the current uh, 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 you know, uh, um, uh, um, treatment that is suggested for the treatment of COVID-19 be done uh, in, in, in on clinical trial basis. Remember, uh, 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 my colleague uh, and friends, remember that uh, the uh, safety of the healthcare worker is also a, as a, is a priority as the safety of the patient. So uh, uh, wearing your PPE and then managing yourself uh, is very important. Please follow your authorized guidelines to mitigate disease spread and don't listen to rumor. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Appreciate it, Dr. Abdel Razik. What was really very interesting uh, uh, 
and informative uh, uh, presentation. Uh, we learned something new about you. Uh, you are very artistic in uh, designing uh, slides. I enjoy them. Uh, maybe I will take a special uh, session on how to design uh, these uh, slides. Uh, and uh, we have important uh, 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 take-home messages. Uh, I'm sure it raised a lot of uh, questions and uh, we'll leave all questions that uh, I received a lot here in the uh, website uh, and in the hashtag uh, to the end of uh, all presentations. Uh, sure. Luckily, we have uh, Dr. Hatim uh, Alhani. Uh, hopefully, the technical issue is over. Uh, we cannot afford to not to miss your presentation. Uh, this is one of our core uh, presentation here in this uh, seminar. Dr. Uh, Hatim Alhani. Beautiful. Yes. Okay. Go ahead, Dr. Hani. Dr. Hatim. And now, uh, it's my pleasure to be with you here. Uh, I would like to give you an overview of this coronavirus, uh, COVID-19. Now, I think most of us are aware of uh, this uh, enemy. Now, it is since um, December till now, we are struggling with it. And it has invaded the world. Now, as uh, my colleague said, we are almost reaching uh, 750,000 infection and mortality exceeding 35,000 uh, human pain. Now, this is not a joke. We are dealing with a very serious infection. It's uh, bring us back to the previous pandemics. Now, we had uh, in the kingdom recognized it in April 2012, and uh, we, we lost more than 800 uh, persons since then and uh, what we call it uh, the mid uh, middle east uh, coronavirus mers cov now <clears throat> now we know it we dealt with it over the last uh, seven years almost and know how it is uh, sad to miss our loved ones now uh, corona actually uh, first recognized in animals in 1930s and uh, in 1960s it started to be recognized as very common reaching to up to 10% of uh, uh, common colds like symptoms, what we call flu-like symptoms. But the, 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 um, the tragedy comes when it hits in 2003, what we call it now SARS number one. It, it hits again in China, but it spreads mainly in other uh, countries, especially in Canada and so on. Now, SARS gave us uh, some good background about uh, the COVID-19, but as I said, in April 12th, start to bring a new uh, type, which is MERS-CoV. Now, the MERS-CoV uh, uh, was through the camel and bats, and again, we don't know a lot of questions, a lot of things to know about MERS-CoV, as well as uh, the COVID-19. Now, uh, what we know is little about the behavior and the dynamics of the virus. Now, since then, it has been uh, accelerating uh, uh, through the, the world, and it had been um, in different globes, in different countries, it hit everywhere, almost no single country now without reported cases. Now, again, the, the, I will try to skip some of the repetition. It was, again, reported first in uh, Wuhan in China and laboratory confirmed cases. It caused uh, a lot of uh, infections. It is uh, the spreading. This is the secret of it. It's spread in almost every one infected person could infect three to four persons. And the mortality is not uh, less than uh, 3%. This is the pathway of the outbreak. And uh, you see the first death from reported in Wuhan in, in, uh, in January in 9 uh, one And subsequently, there is increasing everywhere. Uh, this is the current status. As I say, almost hitting 750,000 infected 
at reach by talking now uh, 35,000 uh, 35, and uh, 150 recovery. Now here the kingdom, we had almost, we reach now uh, 1,453 1, and we reached to 115 recovered and we had eight mortality. Now, uh, what is what is uh, the the behavior of the disease? Almost eighty percent of cases are mild, and uh, this this is the same in our country. Now, thirteen to fifty percent, fifteen percent, they are severe developing pneumonia and uh, uh, upper respiratory symptoms, not only shortness of breath. Average of 4.5 to 5 percent critical, with key to respiratory failure, septic shock, and multi-organ failures. And in about two percent, uh, it is fatal. The mortality rate is two to three percent, and it uh, comorbidity, older ages, and uh, this is the, the the most cases will create uh, problems. Now, relatively few cases seen for unknown reason in children, and also the pregnant women are having less chance to get uh, complication with it. Now, usually the symptoms is most of the cases, up to 90% of the cases if you combine fever, cough, and shortness of breath. Now, these are uh, the commonest early signs of COVID, and this is just flu-like symptoms. Uh, other sign and symptom could be their gastrointestinal uh, symptom like area, vomiting and abdominal pain, but these are the most common uh, symptoms. Now, what is the common comorbidity? And these associated with increased fatality, now cardiovascular disease, diabetes, chronic respiratory disease, hypertension, malignancy, and there is a good percentage of none of the existing conditions. Now, uh, this is what we are uh, trying to concentrate. Now, people with, with uh, elder ages and comorbidity, they should be at high risk to look for in hospitals. That's why the containment in the quarantine is for uh, low risk. Uh, now, this is the, some of the, the uh, reviews showed that the elder ages are the highest risk. It's 15 percent. They have mortality. They are at ease plus and uh, down if they are younger and so on. Now, why is that maybe contributing to immunity and comorbidity? Now, uh, if you compare to uh, other viruses, uh, which cause flu-like symptoms, usually the incubation period is uh, two to 14 days. This is uh, the uh, standard for it. it could exceed that. There is a sporadic reported cases might reach to three weeks and more. Now this, we observe it in MERS-CoV in immune compromise, especially with uh, renal failure. Now, uh, SARS was two to seven days, and MERS-CoV five days, but it ranged from two to uh, four uh, days. Now, swine flu is one to four days, like any flu, and seasonal flu is two days with a range of one to four days. Um, the incubation period, there is, there is a lot of study about it, but uh, what we agree, what they agreed on the observation is all uh, two to 14 days is there. Usually the symptoms start by five point. Thank you.
uh, the, the World Health Organization and all the, the institutes, CDC, and uh, they still considering to, to 14 days as the incubation period. And uh, this is the uh, logarithm for it, and it is reaching high. I will come here. I, I think this is for healthcare workers, uh, which we are really trying because this is our resources, our tools, and their protection is very important to us. And that's why we need them to be fully protected when they are managing the suspect and the confirmed cases. Now, the, the, still the standard is, is a droplet and the standard uh, precautions. And for any uh, aerosol generating procedures, they should go for droplet for airborne precautions. Now, the, the physical triage and triaging patient at point of entry to the health institute is very essential. And this will uh, decrease the chance of missing cases and unprotected exposure. Now, this is very serious issue and we all should, should emphasize on triaging patient coming to the frontliner, especially emergency department or willy clinics. Now, no exception in that. Everybody should be triaged. Now, even healthcare worker should be triaged in, in entry to their, their works. And we found it very effective and it is very important preventive measure to pick up those people at point of entry, regardless wherever they come. They are employees, non-employees, healthcare workers, Anybody should come to the service should be triaged. Now, what we are looking for, fever, cough, and shortest of uh, breath plus history of contact. A pandemic area or, or household, neighbors, anybody who suspected or confirmed cases to be considered as high risk. Now, this is very important in arrival as a said in reception, and we should follow the guidelines scoring and uh, uh, should be should be done consistently 24 by 7 and this is very important mean of prevention and uh, uh, it could um, prevent uh, major exposure and we have we are seeing it die by a triage and physical examination of people at risk, I mean, healthcare workers, and any procedure, close contact. Now, spacing starts again from point of entry. We shouldn't be close as much as we can to the patient, and we should be a priority, a priority of necessary intervention and close contact to the patient. Now, the environment and should be helped to do a spacing, waiting area, respiratory triage area, and at point of uh, entry. We should uh, make ourselves smart in uh, doing essential things and leave unnecessary procedures, interventions, x-rays, and rooming around unnecessary in the hospitals and the clinics. Uh, this is very, very important uh, area where exposure will happen. Now, hello. Uh, are you done, Dr. Hakim? I can't see the screen, sorry. I have. Start anyway. video. Uh, I may continue if you like. Please. Uh, because I can't see the screen there. Uh, okay, it comes again. Now, um, um, I don't know if you can see my uh, slides. Dr. Hanan? Yeah, we can. Looks okay. good. Nebulizing and, and uh, drug 
We lost you, Dr. Hartin. Yeah. Yes. You could know. Now, the general nursing care is again, uh, should be directed as, as much as we can uh, to the necessary. We, we should minimize interventions and uh, uh, organize it according to the needs. Collection of an induced sputum specimen, swabbing, Sectioning is very high risk, and this is the most dangerous step in dealing with patient and should be managed as airborne. Now, airborne setting means negative pressure room, and if it is not available, we have to have a portable HIPAA filter, not closed room. It has to be supported by portable HIPAA filter or negative pressure. Now, uh, uh, outdoor swabbing, there is no such facility, might be alternate for that. Uh, resuscitation and intubation, suctioning or extubation, again, this is very dangerous, very high risk procedure, and maximum precaution should be done while doing that. Uh, we had in the uh, super separators, and this is, this is very important at the community level. People come from abroad and we expected more to come now from Europe, United States, wherever they come. They should be uh, self-isolation, if not in the quarantine for 14 days. And they are creating very high risk. There is 80% chance to carry no symptoms, but still they can carry the bug and transmit it to others. Every person could uh, transmit the disease to 4% and so on. In, in, in one day, two day, you will be surprised by thousands of people can be transmitted. Now, spacing and uh, avoiding uh, crowdness time in the supermarket, especially people in the blockade. Now in the closers, they try to go in specific time for, for shopping. And this is very dangerous practice. Now you can acquire the infection from unknown source, asymptomatic people. Either primary or secondary infected, they can, they can spread the disease to others. Uh, as I said, and I'm stressing that, up to 80% they are asymptomatic and still they are capable to spread the disease to others. Now, they spread by, by either coughing, sneezing, any respiratory activity, either directly without spacing. Now, safe space is less than, or sorry, one more than 1.2 to 1.5 meters acceptable. Uh, the maximum you can do is the best and indirect by touching hands, contaminated hands from the respiratory symptom by shaking hand, that's why avoid shaking, avoid uh, close uh, hugging, kissing, and all these activities very essential to prevent the spread. Now, uh, we, we observe the, the practices nowadays in the kingdom, people are, are rushing to the supermarket markets and uh, other areas to get themselves uh, their needs and they forget their protection mechanism. Now, they again and again, with any sign and symptom of respiratory, especially in the endemic area, area, you should report yourself and don't delay that, especially if you are in contact with all the ages and high risk, the one mentioned before. Uh, the, the, how contagious is COVID? It is in, in, if you compare it to others, it, it comes here, 1.5 uh, 
to 2.5, but what we are seeing now in China and other reports in, in Europe, it reached to four. Now, the R0 is very high. That's why this is one issue, why it is uh, very devastating in the transmissibility. Uh, now, this is this is back in the history, but uh, uh, this is this is what we are facing now. Case fatality rate, as I said, it's up to five percent, the average of three uh, percent, uh, one point five to three point five depends on the uh, facility available. Now, what we are seeing increase in the in the fatality because the burden of on healthcare services is too much. That's why what you are seeing and hearing everywhere, flattening the care, now preserving the healthcare facility for the high risk and their maximum needs. That's why flattening the care is very essential by blocking, by quarantine, and and so on. Uh, uh, a lot of myth uh, has been crowned, uh, uh, developed during uh, the last uh, couple of weeks. Now, conspiracy theory, whatever the reason, whatever the source, please look for the uh, view from people is dying. We have the time and the glitter later on to ask these questions. But now our big question, how to prevent the disease stop the spread and isolate the sources. Now, I think this is our challenge, how to pick up the people early, isolate, trace the contact and improve the containment. Stay home, spacing is the hallmark. I think uh, what other questions could be discussed <coughs> after the myth. Now we are in the, in the middle of the, of the, of the tragedy, and we should concentrate on these factors. Now, we should re reduce the risk of infection by personal hygiene, spacing, and isolating ourselves as much as we can from others. And this is the, the dynamic of COVID compared to others. Everyone could, could transmit to others and the circle will continue. This is compared to other contagious diseases. Now, travel restriction already done, quarantine and border closure has been created, community separate control. This is very, very important. And people should be aware of that. You can't uh, uh, do the, the, the gatherings at home or indoor. It is the same principle. Minimize the contact with others. Testing and testing and testing is very essential. Strengthening the health system, this is what we are trying, and reserve it for those in need, looking for effective antiviral vaccine. Monoclonal antibody might be uh, effective in the developing community against, but this would take time. That's why we should rely on strengthening the health system for the highly needed people and stop the community spread and the aborted uh, cases to be isolated before it comes. Now, it is very serious. And when you look at this sad picture, all of us should stand up and he, everybody should do his responsibility in the containment and the control of the spread. Now, I think we feel all of us responsible for that, and I'm sure we can do it, but it is not a uh, healthcare system only, it is a community. Every person should do his responsibility to control the spread. Otherwise, you see the picture there in Italy, in Spain, in, in other country where they cannot control it. I'm sure we can do it, and inshallah, we will pass it. I'm done, thank you very much. And, thank you, uh, thank you, Dr. Hatim. Uh, with the nice, uh, uh, summary, uh, and inshallah, we, we occur your uh, uh, wish that uh, this uh, pandemic uh, will be over soon. Uh, now we shift gear to uh, to uh, the only surgeon here in the, uh, in the at least uh, as a speaker, uh, long time uh, uh, 
uh, uh, colleague, Dr. Mohamed Al Kahtani, Director of Multi Organ Transplant Center uh, from King Fahad Specialist Hospital here in the MAP, Saudi Arabia. Uh, and we do need to uh, uh, hear from him important uh, recommendation and precaution for solid organ transplant patient during COVID-19 pandemic. Mike is your uh, Dr. Muhammad. Unmute, unmute, please. Yes. Is it okay now? Yes. Okay. So, أولاً السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته نسأل الله سبحانه وتعالى أن يرفع عنا البلاء إن شاء الله ويشفي جميع مرضى المسلمين طبعاً first of all thank you so much Dr. Han for the nice introduction second because for the following reason because I'm a surgeon it's the last talk and maybe it's very boring right now after a long time uh, we have been waiting. I uh, would like to um, um, uh, thank the organizing committee, uh, IFAR Society, as well as IFNTRO. Uh, my pleasure for uh, everybody to be, to be with you um, uh, tonight. Um, hopefully, um, I will stick to time, 20 minutes, and uh, it's going to be very brief, very short, and hopefully it's going to be uh, very precise. I think I have some. Hello. Uh, share share screen, please. Share screen. Click the green share screen, please. Yeah, I did. I did share. already. Just give it one second. It will, it will appear. Share screen, doctor. I shared already. Is it okay now? No, uh, click again, please. Is it okay now? Is it okay? Can you hear me? We can hear you very well, but we don't see... Uh... The presentation? The presentation, not yet. Share the screen now again. Uh, close this uh, website, please, uh, Hannah. Okay. It, it's, it should be behind this. It's in the, the background. If you uh, downsize the Pages, you, you find it. Minimize side. Minimize your, your screen. It is behind it. Until you get your. Uh, is it okay now? Beautiful. Yes. Please go ahead. Did you hear me? The uh, come closer to your mic and uh, go ahead. Uh, the transmission is yours. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah, salatu wassalamu ala Rasulullah. Nasa Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala an yirfa' anna hadha al-balawish bi jami' al-marda, ya Rab. Thanks so much, Dr. Hanan, for your nice introduction. Uh, second, um, it's my pleasure tonight to be with you all on this uh, webinar, sharing our experience uh, and talking mainly about the precaution for solid organ transplantation during uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic. I uh, would like to thank the uh, organizing committee, mainly IFAR Society, as well as uh, IFNTRO. Uh, again, being a surgeon on the last talk, I'm uh, gonna stick uh, hopefully to the time, uh, being very brief, short, and uh, hopefully precise. So um, with no further delay, with no introductions, Dr. Uh, Abdul Razak as well as Dr. Ha Hatim, uh, they have given very nice uh, talks. So talking about the transplantation uh, patients, patients are more palatable because being uh, uh, chronic patients with chronic disease, so they are more palatable to uh, have COVID-19 infection. 
and also uh, uh, all of those patients are immunocompromised. And this is actually another uh, issue which uh, will subject them to a uh, high risk of, of getting the infection. Uh, so far, there is no clear guidelines for the organ donation and the transplantation. And all what have been written actually is just a position statement or uh, as per the experience of each country, talking about the North America, Europe, as well as Saudi Arabia. So what are the modes of transmission? Uh, modes of transmission, we have two modes, either donor to recipient, where there will be a droplet uh, through the respiratory spread, or could have a positive viremia. The other important issue, and that's why we want to minimize the rate of surgeries, minimize the rate of admissions, is another important of a transmission, which is the nosocomial. Uh, the, the, the transplant patient will get the infection either from the patients, uh, visitors, uh, healthcare providers, aerosolized and surface contamination, or it could be a community acquired infection. So uh, transplant patients with COVID-19, they have something unique which is progression to pneumonia may be more common than other group of uh, patients. Maybe they are more immunocompromised. This is one issue. And the other thing, they have greater viral burden uh, with greater infectivity. Some ethical issues, if you want to talk about the ethical issues, uh, just thinking loudly, Inshallah, we will not reach to the stage that the European countries has reached to. Uh, a lot of patients requiring a lot of, of, of ICUs, ORs, ventilators. But let's assume that we have limited resources. What are you going to do? Are you going to do more transplant patients? In the other hand, you won't be able to have more uh, resources. Uh, or are you going to save COVID-19 patients? Um, is it ethical to start patients after transplant during this uh, uh, era on immunosuppression, which will make them more um, uh, compromised? If I will talk about the solid organ transplantation, we are talking mainly about the kidney transplantation as well as liver transplantation. So I, uh, I want to throw uh, most of the policies and guidelines that have been written by other countries, as I have mentioned earlier. And it depends on the protocol of the country. It depends, again, on how many COVID-19 patients do they have. And it depends, uh, again, on the resources that they do have. But um, uh, as a general principle, uh, for, um, I mean, all living donor kidney uh, transplantation um, uh, were suspended because we know they are elective surgeries and those patients actually, they can be maintained on uh, uh, dialysis. Uh, kidney pair uh, donation also uh, have been suspended. The cadaveric donor transplant, they uh, continue with that only for urgent cases. How about the Spain experience? They take it actually case by case evaluation based on the availability of resources. But definitely, if you have, if you have more COVID-19 patients positive requiring more admission, as I have mentioned, more ICUs, more OR, then you have to delay as much as you can um, uh, and you try to uh, deal with the uh, crisis of COVID-19 infection. So again, in Spain, they take it case by case evaluation based on the resources. How about the Italy? Uh, they actually classified it into two groups. The first group, the epidemic area where they continue with the transplant, but only for urgent cases. The non-epidemic area, they were actually very liberal uh, doing both urgent and non-urgent liver transplantation. How about the North America? They did hold all living donor liver transplantation except for pediatric patients with acute liver failure. And by the way, most of the transplants in North America uh, are cadaveric donor liver transplantation, and actually they do small number of 
uh, live donor liver transplantation. And most of those cases, if not all, are uh, low uh, milk sodium. So the most of the transplantation in North America is cadaveric liver uh, transplantation. So they uh, suspended all living donor liver transplantation except for the urgent cases. For the cadaveric liver transplant, only for fulminant liver failure, high milk sodium, more than 20 or 25, and patients with hepatocellular carcinoma. Now, in our country, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, again, there is no clear guidelines. So each center in the kingdom, they created their own policy, and actually it's changing every now and, uh, and then on a daily basis according to the current situation. So the recommendations, uh, temporary suspension of living donor liver transplant, except for uh, high milk, 25 and above, and to continue with hepatocellular carcinoma. And by the way, those patients with hepatocellular carcinoma, they can wait up to six to eight weeks. But if you decide to put on hold the patients with hepatocellular carcinoma, then you have to manage. What do I mean by you have to manage? You have to maintain the other modalities of, of treatment in the form of taste, tear, uh, uh, ablation. Uh, so you could bridge the patient until you find the suitable time and the suitable donor to proceed with liver transplantation. How about the disease donor liver transplantation? Uh, you, here in Saudi Arabia, we continue as per the instruction of the Saudi Center of Organ Transplantation and as per uh, the uh, center's uh, policy and uh, guidelines. Talking about the liver transplant, actually, as we all know, it's not like kidney transplant. The kidney transplant, most of the cases are elective cases. You can maintain the patients on hemodialysis until you find the suitable time, but this is actually not the situation with liver transplant patients. Uh, liver transplant patients, if they have high milk, they do have high mortality. So it's a dilemma now. What are you going to do? If you compare those two groups of patients, patients with end-stage liver disease with high milk, more than 20, with patients of positive COVID-19. Uh, as we know, the mortality is around 2 to 3% in patients with COVID-19, but patients with the high milk, definitely they have high mortality. So patients with milk sodium of 20, the mortality is around 19.6%, milk 30 is around 52.6%, uh, and milk of 40 is uh, 71%, which is really high mortality. How about the outpatient visits? Shall we continue like before the era of, of COVID-19? The answer definitely is, is, is a big no. Uh, we need to have the usual precautions as uh, it was mentioned earlier. We need to limit uh, the outpatient uh, visits. We need actually also to, li to limit the number of, of uh, family members uh, with the patient and we have to activate or to utilize the uh, telemedicine or the phone call. What we did actually, we requested all of our, our staff to go through the list to identify those patients listed in each clinic and to screen those, those patients to, 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 to make sure who are the urgent cases. For example, if you have like 15 patients, two or, or, or three uh, of them are urgent, then the consultant himself or herself, they have to make the screening over the phone uh, to ask about the usual, uh, uh, to identify whether those patients are high risk or low risk. Uh, and I wouldn't elaborate more. This has been mentioned by Dr. Um, Hatem uh, being, you know, uh, traveling abroad, being symptomatic, contact with um, uh, COVID-19 positive uh, patient, uh, working in an institute with uh, positive cases. Uh, after that, after the arrival of the patient, of course, you need to run what's called visual triage, uh, and this was uh, uh, elaborated nicely by Dr. Amir. Uh, so uh, after screening of patients, you select the most or the top urgent cases, and you have to see them within a very short time in the clinic 
and make sure no family members uh, with them and try to minimize the hospital stay for those outpatients. So what we have done, talking about King Fahd Specialist Hospital in the MAM, for the kidney transplant patient, for the pre-transplant, we postponed all uh, pre-transplant patients' workup. And for the uh, liver, we uh, see only the urgent cases. We uh, put everything uh, suspended for two to three weeks. And then after that, we will evaluate the urgent cases of end-stage liver disease, high mild HCC, uh, uh, and then we'll take them, you know, uh, case by case. For the post-transplant uh, patient, we have to make sure that they are on the ideal dose of immunosuppression. Uh, we should emphasize the uh, importance of uh, prevention measures, as we have mentioned earlier, and we need to minimize the in-person uh, visits. If you have a post-transplant patient who is complaining of upper respiratory symptom or any other symptoms, uh, he or she shouldn't come to the hospital immediately. Uh, they have to make a phone call to, the to that transplant center. And then on the phone, we'll take a detailed history. If the patient is required to come to the hospital, they have to wear a surgical uh, mask. And upon arrival, we have to uh, have a clinical assessment for COVID-19. And if they are from a high-risk area or having respiratory symptoms, then we'll do the COVID-19 test with other investigations in the form of chest X-ray and other blood work. If the COVID-19 test came positive, then we'll treat them. If it came, uh, uh, sorry, if it comes negative, then uh, we will uh, assist them uh, and make sure they don't have any other issues. For the uh, uh, transplant recipients, we uh, usually, after the, the, the screening over the phone, uh, upon arrival, we do visual triage, and we have to stratify those patients into two groups, either low-risk group, and usually those low-risk uh, group, they will be uh, going for a um, uh, uh, workup of transplant. High-risk group, or being symptomatic again, will do the COVID-19 test. If it's negative, uh, they will be clear for transplant. If positive, the transplant will be postponed. Now, the organ donation. When we say organ donation, we are talking about the uh, living donors and the cadaveric donors. Um, just I will give some ideas about the Canadian recommendations. For the uh, living donors, usually they do the test twice. And the second test should be only 24 hours from the time of donation, and travelers must wait at least 14 days. For the disease donors, all disease donors, as a rule, they should have the COVID-19 test done, and if it's positive, the donor will be declined. If it's negative, the donor will be assessed uh, for suitability of, of, of donation. How about the Saudi Center for Organ Transplantation? They actually uh, came up with the position <laughs> statement a few days ago. And uh, for the disease donor, you have to do the COVID-19 test. If the COVID-19 test positive, this is very easy, uh, the donor is going to be declined. If the COVID-19 is negative, then again, you have to stratify those cadaveric donors into three groups. Low risk with no history of traveling abroad, no history uh, of uh, having any symptoms, and no history of contact with any positive uh, COVID-19 patients. So this is very early. We'll make the equation very easy. Uh, very easy. The low risk patients will be accepted for donation. The high risk will be as the same as COVID-19 positive, and definitely they will be declined. But for the intermediate risk, where difficult actually to know if the donor has a history of traveling abroad um, or if the um, uh, uh, donor have any epidemiological uh, link. If you are in doubt, difficult to find the, 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 the history, then you classify those 
uh, cadaveric donors as donors with intermediate risk. And then this, this case really, it, it creates a lot of dilemma. And uh, I think it has to be discussed case by case according to the, uh, how urgent is your recipient? Uh, uh, the uh, other thing, uh, the uh, regulations of the Saudi Center for Organ uh, Transplantation. And then after that, you take the decision whether you uh, accept or decline the cadaveric donor. This is, again, I wouldn't elaborate that much, but this is the uh, criteria for Ministry of Health updated case um, as of uh, suspected case definition. Uh, criteria one, patients who are uh, symptomatic having at least one symptom, either fever, cough, or other respiratory illness, in addition to the epidemiological link, had a history of travel abroad, travel uh, to a high-risk area, close physical contact with positive patients, or working in an institute with positive COVID-19 patients admitted to that institute. Criteria two for adult patients who have actually been admitted to the ICU with a very severe respiratory illness. How about living donors? For living donors, you have to screen those donors. You have to do the, 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 the visual triage and you have to classify those donors into two groups, either low risk group, if they are low risk, you proceed with the donation immediately. If high risk group, then you have to do the COVID-19 test, preferably you do it twice. If it's negative, you clear the donor for donation. If it's positive, of course, you wouldn't accept that donor. Our experience at King Fahd Specialist Hospital in the man, we did post uh, postpone all living donor kidney transplantation and the diseased donor again we take them case by case as per uh, the urgency and the uh, uh, Saudi Center for Organ Transplantation uh, policy. Suspension also of all living donor transplants except for again urgent cases, milk sodium more than 25, hepatocellular carcinoma because of the high mortality and for the deceased donor, we usually take it again case by case as per the urgency of, of, of the uh, uh, patients and the collaboration or agreement with the uh, SCOT. For the outpatient, um, uh, we are usually doing the same. We try our best to minimize the number of patients. If you need to see a patient, then you have to shorten the uh, time uh, uh, of a stay in the, in the OBD, for example, you need to do the blood work. You ask the patient to come alone without any convenience and you would draw the blood. You ask the patient to leave immediately. The clinical nurse coordinator will take care of this. She will check the result of the uh, blood work and um, communicate with the treating physician and immediately they will call the patient to take the ideal action. And uh, we uh, instruct all of the patients to follow the usual precautions. And we have to make sure that all medications will be sent uh, to our patients. And what we have done actually, we have some quarantine area in the Eastern province. So what we have done basically, uh, those staff who work there in the quarantine, I mean, who live, sorry, who live there in the quarantine area, uh, we will ask them to see the post-transplant patients. And we have established what's called a transplant satellite clinics, both for the kidney as well as the liver patients, uh, covered by a consultant from our hospital. And we usually see those patients fresh, immediate post-transplant within um, uh, 90 days. And whatever is required, for example, the blood work will be uh, taken uh, from that satellite clinic and immediately transported to our hospital uh, we'll do the blood work. Again, the clinical nurse coordinator will communicate the result with our staff there covering the clinic. And honestly, we, we, we found it very, very useful. So the conclusion, coronavirus disease 2019 COVID-19 is rapidly spreading. Adequate resources should be available for COVID-19 patients. There is no established guidelines for the organ donation, donation and transplantation suspension of living donor kidney transplant, uh, transplantation, and this actually what we have done, uh, uh, limit the liver transplantation only for urgent cases, 
utilization of other modalities uh, for outpatients like the phone call or telemedicine, uh, reassessment of the current situation every now uh, and then. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Muhammad. Yeah, uh, please, uh, all, all the speaker, please open your camera oh, yeah, and your mic. Uh, thank you, thank you a lot. Uh, we do appreciate all the presentation. Uh, we heard a lot of guidelines. Uh, actually, we see very active participation. We uh, reach more than 3,000 uh, participants. Uh, it's really, we had a good overview uh, of different uh, fruitful uh, presentations. Uh, uh, actually, my concern and uh, the concern of all healthcare providers nowadays is about uh, the myth. What is the truth? What is the myth? Uh, so a lot of rumors. And uh, unfortunately, uh, it's go viral in the social media now because everything now is in social media, so it go viral. So we hear a lot of things. Uh, and I think if one important message that we can uh, send out there to the, uh, uh, to the public is that uh, you have to make sure that your information come from the right sources, uh, which is the health authority in your country. And, and this is uh, actually the right way. Uh, and yes, I, I, I do agree that we should restrict uh, and limit who should uh, uh, convey uh, uh, some of uh, uh, the public uh, or, or face the public uh, uh, <coughs> in the social media. So a question came to me, uh, Dr. Mohammed, because you were the last, so uh, it's about transplant. Uh, uh, and I do receive a similar question is about uh, uh, discounting some of the medications in patient post transplant. Uh, how do you uh, view this? So they they would not be vulnerable by by having a lot of immunosuppressive uh, medication. Specifically, they mention like the methyl prednisolone or the prednisolone. So what do you think, Mohammed? Uh, yeah, it's, uh, thank, you so much. thank you so much, Dr. Hanan, for this uh, question. But uh, definitely, uh, we don't ask patients to reduce the dose of immunosuppressive uh, uh, medications. Uh, you need to maintain their treatment, and it hasn't been approved that those patients uh, whom you lower the uh, dose of their medication will result in more protection uh, against COVID-19. So we'll keep the same dose, actually. So the message here for patients not to take decision themselves. They have to go back to, your, yeah. to their uh, transplant uh, center. Uh, Dr. Hatem, uh, a lot of uh, questions came about uh, epidemiology and so on. Uh, but I, I found here an interesting uh, question, which is about transmission to babies, since you are a pediatrician. Uh, can you enlighten us about this? Uh, uh, we hear that uh, infected mother, uh, uh, many of them, they don't transmit to the baby or, or, or it's a different ball game. It's all yours, uh, if you can clarify this issue. Uh, thank you for the question. Critical transmission, yeah. yeah it's transmission for, for... from mother to baby, a pregnant mother to their to baby. baby, yeah. If she's there, is some, there is uh, there is reported cases of fetal, but you know, is it is it uh, before delivery or after delivery? It's it's unclear because this is we don't know really the dynamics of the virus there. In general, the, the rate of infection to develop a disease in in pediatrics is very low. If you if you review the literatures from China and other countries. Hardly will see more than a couple of hundreds and compared to a thousand of infected adults. But really, this is, this is a very uh, unknown reason why pediatrics, they don't have from the picture of disease. Mm -hmm. Now, they might carry the box. And um, we, had, we had experience with MERS-CoV, the same with MERS-CoV. MERS-CoV, we have very few uh, pediatrics and and uh, and women's and pregnant women's 
But there is, there is a question, what is the mechanism of that? Why pediatrics and uh, pregnant women are relatively protected from being diseased? Yes, they can carry the blood, but to, to develop the disease is not clear. Now, neonatal, neonatal there is political cases, case reports, but we don't have a real uh, uh, data about uh, the mood of transmission, vertical transmission, or both delivery, it is unclear. But really, uh, this is so far what we know, and there is a lot of, we, of questions we can't answer it right now. Another question is, uh, is there a country immune to the infection or has less prevalence than other countries? No, no, there is, there is you know, the disease is imported. Those, those close borders, they have, they have less reported cases. And the other reason, they don't have the test. Either they are deficient in testing or they are not in contact with the outside. And you see, this is where the country, they have mixed population or the, the border is open and they have the test capabilities, then you will have a lot of reported cases, like what happened now in the US and Europe. That's why the people start blocking their borders and counting their numbers. Uh, for any, any, any one of the, of the speaker, uh, if the patient infected with COVID uh, uh, and treated and BCR became negative and uh, discharged home, will he have recurrence or any chance or any reported cases that he can transmit or have a recurrence of infection? Um, okay, now there is there is a reported, but we don't know whether it is a reach border reinfection or it is a false negative test. You see, the rate of positive or the rate of predictive value of the BCR it's at maximum 70%, which, which each BCR, you have a chance of getting 30% false negative. Now, again, the technique is very critical. If it is not done in the appropriate way, the storage, the transportation, you have, again, high chance to, to uh, reduce the yield of the test. That's why sometimes you presume it is, it is true positive or true negative, but you have a really good percentage of false negative and false positive. The best yield is transtracheal. The go deep in the respiratory tract, the more the predictive value of the test. You go the oropharyngeal, it is low, and the best among the upper is, is, is deep uh, uh, nasopharyngeal swab. The technique, the storage, the transportation, is, is have a very important predictive value in the test. Uh, last question for you, Dr. Uh, Hatem Al Hani. Uh, is the virus airborne transmission? This, the, the, if if uh, the basic is no, it's droplet and contact. But if it is with any intubation or uh, realized generating procedure, then it has to be felt as airborne. Treatment. Thank you, appreciate it. Uh, Dr. Abdelrazi, uh, we do, uh, we hear all the guidelines, it's beautiful, and uh, you presented to Wakaya. Uh, actually, I'll give you two, uh, two questions at the same time, or three questions, and you organize them uh, uh, in, in whatever way you want to uh, start with any one of them. Uh, Wakaya, uh, uh, is, is this, uh, shared by, by all healthcare providers here in Saudi Arabia, number one. Number two, we uh, are our recommendation or preference of uh, dialysis, uh, whether hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis in this era, does it change now? Would you prefer hemodialysis? And again, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory in these patients. Uh, what do you think, your view? Okay, so... Um... In reference to uh, first order wakaya, this is a national um, healthcare um, um, guidelines that is uh, uh, prevailed to all healthcare uh, 
sectors in the kingdom here, the private sector and the government sectors. And uh, I think uh, they are uh, they they, are put, they are keep updating their guidelines frequently, and uh, they are up to the bar. Um, each institute knows their their capability and their um, uh, measures that they can enhance in, and therefore uh, they use the the wakaya as the foundation for development or enhancement of their own uh, uh, infectious control uh, process. So wakaya is one. However, uh, Wikaya does not talk about dialysis patient in depth. Uh, Wikaya gives you a general information about how to handle patient contact uh, and uh, uh, the definition, case definition, and what have you, which is very, very important. And by the way, the case definition keeps changing. Now uh, we have included the people from Mecca, uh, Medina, and, uh, and, and Riyadh area as uh, in the case definition. So, so there's up to information and so I, I encourage the healthcare uh, workers to follow the Wikaya as a primary foundation but enhance their uh, needs for particular area uh, by using the specific guidelines from different societies, the World Health Organization, the CDC, the uh, American Society of Nephrology in case of dialysis and so forth. So this is the first. Uh, the second question uh, in reference to um, uh, the uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, it has the same effect like the theoretical effect of the ACE inhibitor by upregulating uh, the ACE enzyme, ACE enzyme 2. So in the same, the, the, the same way I described uh, how the coronavirus uh, S protein attaches itself to the uh, ACE, ACE enzyme is the same. However, uh, in only, uh, um, on the non-steroidal uh, anti-inflammatory drugs, um, uh, there is a clear statement uh, uh, not to use by WHO, not to use uh, the uh, uh, non-steroidal in patients with COVID-19. It increased the virulency of the disease and increased the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, add to the complication of the uh, infection. So this is the second uh, point. The third point I forgot. <laughs> uh, uh, Britonial dialysis. Oh, no, well, um, uh, it, it really does not matter. Um, uh, the most important thing uh, if for patient, the peritoneal dialysis is done at home by the patient and uh, their family. So uh, this is a, the best uh, 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 modality really for the patient to, to treat himself uh, or herself at home. So uh, containment is perfect. You don't have mm -hmm. to try a dialysis center. So it's perfect. But we do not encourage patient to, uh, to change from the hemodialysis to peritoneal dialysis because of that reason. Uh, but patient on hemodialysis, we, um, uh, you know, hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis offer almost the same uh, adequacy of clearance. So there's nothing better than, uh, no modality is better than the other. Uh, now, patient who does uh, manual filling, if they got admitted to the uh, filling, the, the C, what we call the CAPD, uh, um, uh, if they got admitted to the hospital, uh, and they have a, a, a COVID-19 infection, uh, and you do you want to minimize the uh, uh, the uh, contamination and the exposure of the host, uh, the hospital staff or the, the nurses, then you can change the, the modality from the CAPD, which is um, um, you know manual filling and all the thing, into what we call APD, automated using a cycler machine. So this is a machine which will do everything by itself. You don't have to go inside. You just have to disconnect the, the patient. Actually, the patient can disconnect himself by himself. So uh, peritoneal dialysis is a modality, can be used, and the pe people are using it are, um, uh, are safe, really, because they're going to stay in, at home and, uh, um, and uh, will be away from uh, any uh, exposures. Yes. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, really, uh, it's a very uh, informative, uh, very enjoyable uh, meeting and uh, lots of questions. But uh, unfortunately, because of the technical problem we had in the beginning, we started late and uh, our time is level due and uh, we don't want to keep you uh, late. <laughs> All of us will need to uh, wake up uh, early morning. Uh, Go to work. And go to work again, yes, yes. It's, it's, it's for, the, for the doctors, uh, business as usual. Uh, my final message is for all healthcare providers is uh, to uh, really listen to all the precautions that were said. 
protect yourself and your uh, personal protective uh, uh, equipment and uh, be safe. Uh, and for all my colleagues to uh, keep uh, this link uh, and share share information and share this is this is the way we can uh, compact this uh, virus and this uh, uh, pandemic is by sharing information. Be prepared uh, so we can have the best outcome for our loved one. Uh, Unfortunately, we hear from time to time that uh, one of our colleagues that got uh, infected or passed away, uh, our condolences to their uh, uh, family. Uh, and again, uh, I thank all of you for really giving us your valuable time. Uh, inshallah, we'll meet again in person. Uh, and we uh, really... Uh, uh, get over this uh, pandemics. Thank you all and uh, see you in uh, another meeting and appreciate all the time and all the valuable information that you shared with us, with everybody. Our uh, uh, audience reached more than 3,000. Thank you uh, finally for the uh, also organizing uh, uh, event through and uh, uh, all uh, our colleagues from uh, Ithar Society. This is me, Dr. Hanan, and uh, I thank all of you, and uh, have a good night. Bye. Thank you, Dr. Hanan.